Hello, I'm Alexa Greist, Associate Curator and R. Fraser Elliott Chair, Prints and Drawings at the Art Gallery of Ontario. The Art Gallery of Ontario operates on land that is the territory of the Anishinaabe Mississauga Nation and was also the territory of the Wendat and Haudenosaunee. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Toronto is also governed by a treaty between the Federal Government of Canada and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Anishinaabe Nation. Today, I'm going to speak to you about a group of engravings. See here, the Flora Danica. And um, I titled my sort of presentation, uh, What Can You Learn from Prints of Plants? We're in deep freeze in Toronto. And if you're anywhere else um, like Toronto, <laughs> that is cold and snowy, looking at plants, right now and thinking about spring is probably, um, I hope at least, an activity that will be pleasurable today. But I also wanted to ask the question, what can we learn from looking at prints? What can we learn from looking at pictures of, in this case, flora plants from Denmark? The group of prints that I'm going to talk to you about today were a donation from a retired professor of the University of Toronto, uh, Dr. Mary Jane Phillips, an engineering uh, professor, gave the AGO in 2019 these nine engravings with uh, hand coloring done in watercolor. They come from, as I said, the Flora Danica, which is was a, an ambitious uh, project to document, and I will show you here, complete set of the Floridanica. So the prints that I just showed you here would have originally been bound into volumes. The Floridanica was sponsored by the Royal Court of Denmark. And the project took place, as you see here, the dates on the screen, from 1761 until 1883. So 122 years of work went into this project and countless thousands of people worked on the project from the editors who were botanist scholars of the study of plants and zoologists, funny enough zoologists, even though it's plants, but artists, engravers, the people who did the hand coloring. So thousands of people were involved with creating this project. Coming back to the nine prints that the AGO was given um, in 2019, spanning um, from the 1760s up into the early 1800s, coming from a, vol a number of different volumes. As I said, these would originally have been in the bound volumes. It's incredibly common for works such as these floral prints, um, or for example, also architectural prints to have been cut out or removed from bound volumes because the art market um, dictated that people could, might enjoy them more if you could cut them out, put them on your wall. If they're bound, you can only look at one page at a time. Um, so it's um, something that you can consider unfortunate because the works are removed from how they were originally created, but also it spread them um, across the world and spread them to different people and allows us to also look at more than one of them at a time. Now the Floridanica, as I mentioned, was sponsored by the Royal Court of Denmark to capture the plants and to reproduce them and gather them together, all the plants of Denmark and the Danish colonies and surrounding areas. An interesting um, fact to note about the Floridanica was that as borders shifted and politics changed, there were times that certain plants would not have been of interest if they only grew in the very far north as Denmark lost those territories or the very far south, then those plants would no longer be included in the publication. At the, towards the end, it was decided that all of the sort of pan Scandinavian plants should be included. And that allowed um, for a, a more holistic picture and sort of brings the project beyond simply the Danish lands. Now the Floridanica 
It's part of a long tradition of treatises or books, either hand-drawn or printed later, um, that gathered together knowledge about plants. This history is thousands of years long in China, in Egypt, in India, and also um, in Europe. Uh, it relates to the herbal tradition. Here on the screen, I am now showing you a book from the 16th century from 1542 that was printed in Switzerland across the German border, the uh, Leonhard Fuchs, who's the editor, the gatherer of this book. He um, was German. And you see that we have a beautifully hand colored poppy, the reds um, on top of a uh, woodcut. So the works that we're really focusing on today are engravings and I'll go into that in a minute, but this earlier form and a way of spreading this knowledge would have been woodcut. We're looking at a European example. Um, and you see here, there's also text. Now the Floridanica was originally intended to include text but the massive scope of the project in the end, um, only the plates, the illustrations, the engravings were made. But this long tradition gathering together um, descriptions of plants, legends about them, their uses, um, the dangers involved with certain plants, stories around them. This is part of the herbal tradition. And in the 17th century, uh, with the rise of the separation of disciplines, to chemistry, pharmacology, toxicology, the interest in the herbal sort of wanes, although it had been very popular for thousands of years as a way of gathering knowledge, uh, medical knowledge and botanical knowledge. And into the 18th century, we see the move towards the flora, the goal to gather, classify, identify, bring together all these species of plants from a certain geographic area. And that is what the Floridanica is part of. Um, the Floridanica, the other goal was also though to spread knowledge about the uses of the plants. So in some ways you don't lose the herbal um, goals of containing knowledge that would be useful to someone finding the plant or um, useful to avoiding a plant that might be toxic was also to have been um, part of the goal. As I said, the texts were never produced and the books though were distributed quite widely. Um, the hand colored, the colorful versions you see here were much more expensive. We'll go into that in a second. But the simple black and white outline engravings versions were, although still sumptuous and especially in the complete set would have been quite expensive, were distributed by the government quite widely to bishops, hoping that then they would spread it to other clergy members and also to teachers in the areas that they were in charge of so that this knowledge about Danish plants could spread um, widely throughout the kingdom and increase knowledge. I want to look more closely at a few of these works. Here you see a hedgehog mushroom. This is one of my favorites. And I've been talking about them being hand colored engravings. So if you look uh, closely, you can see this nice, the oranges, the reds, uh, down at the bottom of the mushroom, um, the double mushroom that you see uh, sort of green. And this color was applied by individuals. And in the case of most hand coloring of prints, um, because this is the way to color prints, you couldn't print in color um, at this time, was that they hired often children and women because they could pay them less than they would a male who, an adult male by virtue of being allowed to be part of a guild or be part of an apprenticeship system would have had to have been paid more than a woman or a child who had not yet gone through it. Underneath the colors, you can see that there are finer lines and those are the lines of the engraving. Also up at the top where it says, you know, Floridanica uh, and that would be tabula table or what number it is to organize it. You can see these lines, those are engraved lines. And anyone who's heard me talk knows that I love to talk about how things are made, but I'll do it quickly, which is to say that engraving uses a flat copper plate, um, in this case, a copper plate and lines are carved into it. So bits of metal are removed in long sort of threads as a, a, a engraver who's a highly trained professional carves these out. Then when ink is put onto the plate and then wiped very, very, very clean, the ink sits in those valleys, the valleys that have been carved. That is pressed under high pressure 
and a rolling press, kind of like squeezing water out of laundry. And the ink gets pushed into the valleys. You remove the paper, the plate, and there you have in reverse. So in the opposite orientation that it looks on the copper plate, the print. Um, this allowed to make thousands of copies, um, thousands and thousands of these prints. So it's a good method to spread this knowledge. The way that these were made, I mentioned it's a very ambitious project. There were more than 3,000, so I have written, I think, 3,240 engravings. And each one of these was made by the editor and a team of artists going into the field, identifying the plants. The artist would draw the plant from life, um, probably also do the coloring so that they would re remember very carefully how it actually looked, because the goal is identification bring it back and then the engraver would work from the drawings. And then for the colored versions, there would have probably been master ones colored, like examples that the other people um, working on coloring could then follow to keep it consistent. And um, the consistency would have been important because you do want these to look the same as they are spreading out across um, your lands, spreading out and trying to increase knowledge. Here is a slender gentian. Um, one of the requirements was that plants would be alone on each page, each um, type of plant. Um, here you see the entire plant from its root system, but also breaking down what it would look like if you opened up one of these bud type I'm not a, I'm an art historian, I'm not a botanist, but if you open that up, what would be inside here and also what a dry seed pod might look like. So trying to show more than one aspect of the plant's life cycle, which would help someone in identification. I said only one per page. Well, there is an exception, the lichens. Um, and here you see on this page, clearly what look like maybe four different type of lichen. They're all from the same family, you know, these sort of very, very hardy, species that grow very short, often on rocks, um, on wood. And you see the example showing quite a number of uh, the four different types. Here, an autumn hawk bit. And I wanted to end with a little bit of sunshine. So I, uh, this beautiful yellow and the color, the color yellow is a color that often fades quite quickly. Um, if a print or drawing, it's just one of those pigments that when out in the light either will fade. Sometimes pigments will also darken and this shows that these um, were very well um, cared for and kept away from light, which is wonderful and makes them strong examples for us to have at the AGO. One of my favorite details is this single petal down here, which I just, I love. And I want to end by also speaking briefly about um, how these works came into the collection because people often ask um, how the any museum collection grows and they grow through purchase or through gift. And when we think about both purchase and gift, we think about how works will add to the collection, take it in new directions, enrich it, how the works will be in dialogue with other, you know, objects that are already in the collection. And these botanical engravings speak to traditions of knowledge, so spreading the way prints could spread information about um, architecture, about botany, about um, city maps, and just the spread of knowledge. They, they, they fit in there. We also in the library have some beautiful editions of Canadian floras, if I call them that, of different provinces and flowers. Um, the plants. So to add this in um, the historical aspect and bring bring that together to be able to tell that story. Also, uh, prints from the 18th and 19th century, um, engravings in particular, are one of the strengths of the AGO's collection of prints and drawings. And so having hand colored um, botanical prints, which we had none of, no European examples, is a way to expand a way, our ways of talking about what types of prints were made during this time. So always thinking about audience and, and how these works either shown on the wall would work in dialogue or who might be interested in seeing them in our study center when we are available to come together again in person.
So thank you for spending a few moments looking at some flowers. Uh, hopefully we will, uh, you know, it'll come and we'll all soon be looking at the first uh, plants as they, as they come up. And if you live somewhere warm, well, maybe the flowers will be coming back and I don't have a lot of pity for you. Thanks. <laughs>